guys. Can. Here we go. All right, we're recording. All right, great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you to our February. Thank you for coming to our February session of our virtual career series. Today, we're delighted to share a really exciting topic with you guys, careers in tech. And um, we have two speakers with us today. So Alex Platt and Alex can wave. There you are. She's, hey. um, she's an IT professional and her she's a business relationship manager at Procore Technologies and they are in Santa Barbara area. Mm -hmm. And then we have John Boland. John, you want, there's John. And he's in Las Vegas. He's the CIO at the Cosmopolitan Hotel. And so we're all very excited about that. Hopefully after COVID, mm -hmm. we can all come visit John. <laughs> Absolutely. So, they both have amazing presentations for you guys. So we'll make sure to get to that straight away. I just want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping so you guys know a couple things before we get started. Um, first is this is a monthly series that we've been doing each month because of COVID. We want to make sure you guys have access to alumni. So the Com Communication Alumni Council has been pulling together alumni to talk about different careers that you guys can get access to with your comm degree. So we're really excited that today we're gonna to cover careers in tech specifically and a lot of great information about the IT industry. And then the schedule, then the next slide, Alex, is the schedule, which I wanna make sure you guys are aware of. Um, obviously today we're talking about careers in tech. We have March where Alexei is, uh, who's also here joining us, is gonna host next month's session and he's in the advertising industry. And then in April, we've booked another communication alumni council member, Cynthia Tucker, and she's in event management, works at USC. So really excited to be able to cover these other careers with you guys. So please save the date for that. And then the other last minute bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to John and Alex is we do have the chat function. Wanna encourage all of you to please ask questions. So go ahead and just throw any questions in the chat. You're also welcome to just come off mute and ask a question live. We really want to encourage, uh, you know, attendance here for you guys to be engaging with our alumni. So thank you, John and Alex, and I'll turn it over to you, John, to kick us off. Awesome. Thank you. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. So um, today, like we're talking about a uh, in our virtual series careers, uh, we call it IT, it is tech, it's the same thing. So we have myself and Alex are both in that industry. Um, we took different paths and we really want to talk to you about that. Um, but also tell you like where it all started. You know, think people hear IT and they think technology is just this engineering thing and it is so much more. I mean, it's UX design, there's a whole bunch of different, you know, career paths you can go, whether it be from social media, digital influencers, you know, actually having a core engineering degree, um, one of the interesting things is you'll want to pay attention to your um, statistics classes because I myself has uh, not only did, did my first you know, jaunt with statistics in you know, 88, 89 you know, classes at, at UCSB, but then I bumped into them in grad school. I bumped into them getting a Six Sigma certification from GE. And you're always trying to come back to find out you know, what, if you think about Amazon, how do they figure out what to put in front of you to buy? It's statistics, you know, so it's a, it's a good thing to pay attention to. Um, I just want to go to the next slide. Um, so like, like we said on the agenda, you know, what, what is technology? You know, what, what, what can you do in technology? You know, what, what is it? I'm, I'm, I'm a chief information officer. What does that mean? You know, what, what does that do? I've also been in an area called marketing technology. Well, what is that? Um, and then uh, we'll talk, Alex and I will talk about our journeys, where, how we got there share with you a couple organizational views of what, what IT does, and then you know how to get involved, how do you start out, and then you do a little Q&A. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. So information technology, what is it? Well, it's really using, it's the study of the use of systems, you know, commonly associated with computers and telecommunications for storing and retrieving and sending information. Well, isn't that interesting? We're all comm majors and we communicate with information. So that's kind of funny that you know it actually uh, full circle, um, you know, we, we talked about and studied how information is um, distributed between people and there's theories and a whole bunch of things. But, you know, in the beginning, it was just paper. People wrote paper, information in paper, and then people scribed that paper. And then there was the printing press and we had books. People passed books around, right? That, that's interesting. And then people started figuring out, well, how do I calculate all this information, all this paper? God, I got to add it by hand. That sucks. Well, maybe I can put it in some technology. And so they started putting all this information out of paper 
and into these old archaic mainframes with spinning wheels and tape and a whole bunch of different things. And they could get information out of that quicker than if they did it by hand. And so that was actually the first kind of genre of like, wow, we're going to move our information from paper, you know, into some computer system. And isn't that interesting? Okay, wow, that's going to make it faster. And we'll get to that. And then all those mainframes over time got connected to each other. And the next thing you know, all of a sudden, there's this thing called the internet, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit also. And next thing you know, we're all talking about artificial intelligence and computers making decisions and looking at trends, uh, algorithms to figure out what you're going to buy, what's trending on any social media platform. It's all just collecting all that data and it's information not only getting processed faster, but getting processed in a way and the interface changes, you know, how, what, what are you doing? You, know, you think about it, you know, as at NBC, we used to talk about different screen experiences. We talk about the, the television screen experience versus the computer versus your, your handheld and how do you interface and how do you design? That's all information technology. That's all study of the use of the communication and the interface and how it's transferred to you. And all really this technology does at the end of the day, if you really think about it, is technology automates an existing analog or physical process. So a lot of times you'll hear in the news, oh, there's a big digitization effort somewhere or, oh, the new gig economy, what's happening? Like Uber didn't invent ride shares, you know, taxis did, but they had a better way of digitizing the process to make it easier. Instacart, same thing. You know, all these delivery systems they've had, people have tried them before and they failed, but it was the person who really figured out how to make it easy, how to communicate well, what people wanted, and they automated that. So it's at a click of a finger, you know, an upsell cart, a one touch purchase, and it makes it really simple. And that's information technology. So it's not just engineering or building a website or writing a computer program. It's all these other things that happen. And a lot of technology leaders don't even, or in a lot of the, the uh, social media companies and a lot of the startups don't have technology backgrounds. They've just figured out a better way to automate something and make it smarter. And that's information technology. So Alex, next slide. So you kind of look at this and say, wow, what happened? Well, so in the beginning at our own campus at UCSB, um, people started hooking up all those mainframes using 50 kilobits per second. That's scary. In 1969, and a couple, couple institutions did it. One, Stanford Research Institute up, at, up there, UCSB, yeah, our campus, UCLA, and Utah. And all they were trying to figure out is how do I actually share information with network connections? Eventually that became a huge thing for a Department of Defense called DARPANET because you didn't want a single point of failure anywhere. And then that really revolutionized where the internet came to be and hooking up all these websites. And from the websites led to, you know, all the dot coms, all the dot coms led to businesses distributing things, led to mobile apps, led to social media. And the whole industry changed. But in the beginning, so many years ago, 50 years ago, you know, you were sitting there looking at, you know, four different campuses, institutions talking to each other very, very slowly. So it's kind of fun to know that, you know, UCSB was in the beginning of this whole revolution that we are now. Um, next slide. So out of that, those four little connections and all the digitization and everything we're talking about became all these different jobs that you can do in technology. And, you know, Alex, pile on here too with me, uh, but, you know, you have this idea of marketing tech. Well, what's marketing tech? Marketing technology is you go somewhere and you're actually managing the social media that influences, you're trying to drive business, you know, in social media, using the apps, getting people to follow you, getting people to follow your company, your firm, to really make something happen. And then there's digital marketing, which is actually the practice of, you know, just sending emails and campaigns. Another funny note, a lot of the things in digital marketing sound like you're going to war. Like, I'm going to run a campaign. I'm going to target a group. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to make something happen. It's like, okay, great. So digital marketing is doing a lot of things that happen, um, you know, in the world that, you know, really get that target market done, really focus on a group of people to try to get in using statistics, a relevant group of people to come back and use your product and or your service. Um, data analytics is huge. You get all this data and collected from so many different sources. I can't tell you how many different data sources we have, you know, in the casino resort industry. Um, but what's relevant? What do people want? You know, so you're looking at all this data, trying to predict the behavior. And then Amazon, Amazon was, you know, really drove this, you know, early, early on with the Amazon upsell cart 
where you do a shopping behavior and would you like to buy? And everyone's like, ooh, there's actually using big data to make a suggestion driving revenue. Um, CRM, customer relationship management, knowing your customer, how long, what's your, what's your lifetime value, what have you, you know, how much have you spent? How much will you spend? Can I predict how much you'll spend in your lifetime? We're pretty good at that in gaming. We pretty much can figure out every theoretical value of anyone who gambles based on your age, how long, how often you come and how long you gamble, um, how big your bet is. Um, digital and photo editing, this is huge, you know, in marketing tech, you know, all those things that happen, you know, in terms of making a relevant uh, picture, making a relevant a photo, you know, how long that photo is, very important. Um, I mentioned campaign management, offer management, trying to pick the right offer, and you got, it's kind of a science, but it's, it's, it's technology too. It's using data based on inventory and what you have and what you want to sell and how much do you want to discount? What do I price things as? You know, what's my offer, my campaign management, and is it successful? What's my take rate? What's happening? So those are all, mar these are all technology jobs, but you didn't hear me hear about anything about programming, nothing about writing code, user acceptance testing, you know, building a bit better, a better computer, uh, building a faster network is just all about, this is all marketing technology where marketing organizations are looking for skill sets that can get involved and really help them do it. And a lot of it, even with all the computer power that there is out in the world, you know, you still need eyeballs to say, hey, I see a trend. I see what's going on. I see what we should be looking at. And um, that's important. And it just, it takes a lot of, a lot of people looking at all these things, making sure that the photo and the digital editing has a, the correct impact and the right message and creates a successful marketing technology um, experience. Um, I, myself, and Alex are in technology management. So we actually manage different areas of technology. Cybersecurity is a big one. That's always like on, you'll see that on everyone's, um, all the news stories, everyone's talking about who's hacking who, who does what. Uh, so that, that that's really become relevant and you know, making sure Identities are safe and your customers are safe. Applications, you know, everything that happens in a business has an application associated with it, which automates the process. So if you think about, for me, checking in a hotel, I have a property management system that automates the process of someone checking in the hotel, where we used to have reg cards and you fill a piece of paper and you get a manual key. It's all digital now. You know, it all happens electronically. It's all automated. Project management's a big one. It's a big, big, big thing that needs to happen is you get a lot of smart technology people in the engineering side over here, um, but they're not exactly good at uh, writing things down or communicating. They're really good at building technology things, but they really need someone to help them manage their budget, do things on time, make things happen, get customer support, talk to the business and make sure that the business, what they want to do and automate and make something happen is actually what gets built. Um, engineers sometimes have a habit of look what I can do, not what the customer wants me to do. Um, so they help uh, do that. Um, engineering departments are part of management. So you start with an engineer and you have to start managing all the departments and disciplines. Administration's a big thing, contract management, finance management. You know, you get 20, $30 million budgets under your belt and all of a sudden you gotta make sure you have your statement of work and you've done an RFP and you're, you're, you're getting all your um, bids in and that your contracts are there. Every year I have 320, 397 applications. I have to renew for maintenance every year. And I always try to sleep in a 10% increase or you know 20% increase and got a group of people just managing those contracts. Um, architecture, how things are put together. That's a huge part. You know, just um, management itself, you know, getting to where I manage all the departments you know, or managing a division and service desk, big thing. I mean, think about the service desk. People call in about technology projects all the time. How do I use your service? It broke, it didn't work, it didn't register. That's part of technology management. You gotta support your customer. Your customer might be internal, might be external. So all that stuff's going on. Um, product development's a fun one that people get involved in. And a lot of times product development has nothing to do with technology. It's about design thinking about, I just know a better way. These are how all these companies came up with different ideas about, I just know a better way, but I need technology to make that better way work. And sometimes that better way has, you know, not just design thinking involved, but someone's got to manage that new way to log on to a website or how to get an account or how to do things. So there might be a whole product manager, then you get someone who needs to write down these technology ideas. So a tech writer, you know, who can really succinctly put the idea on paper. 
you know, design's thinking about just do it differently. What if I had a credit card? I didn't have to apply for it. It just showed up. Okay, great. Let's make that product. Um, an analyst is someone who's really going through and making sure that the product works. And UX design is huge in terms of, you know, what do people see on a computer screen versus a phone? What's above the screen, below the screen, above the line, below the line? How are people interacting? They start doing analytics and an analyzing. Why didn't they click on this button? Oh, because they couldn't see it on the, on the mobile screen. Oops, let's change the product. Um, then engineering is just kind of the core, what people used to think of technology. It's the networks out there. It's the servers. It's getting into the cloud. It's how, how you do databases and data management. It's being a software developer. It's being a programmer. It's being an architect that actually figures out how different pieces are done. And it could be, a, you know, could engineer security. How do I build a firewall rule that keeps bad people in and, and good people safe? So um, a lot of different things. And this is not, <laughs> this is a, small list, not an exhaustive list, but just a whole bunch of things from very you know, technology oriented on the um, engineering side, very marketing oriented on that side. And then, you know, again, you know, different, different things in between. Hey, John, I wanted to just take a quick moment here to call out a question that we got in from Caesar about video. He asks, I wonder if John or anyone knows of a free video editing program that is better than iMovie. I've been using iMovie for about two years now and I'm beginning to see its limitations now. I'm looking for a job in video editing currently. Um, I've used some open source uh, Macintosh products um, that compete you know, and mainly on the, on, I'll say not so much on the video but on the photo editing side because Photoshop and using different you know, di you know, different masks and doing all that kind of stuff is, is it, it gets really, it gets really, but they have some video ones out there too. Um, I've, I've typically been hanging out with the Adobe products in my career. So um, I've had those available to me, but um, there is open, so there's an open source Mac OS, you know, website and you know, that's where they have a whole bunch of different pretty good programs that mimic some of the larger brands out there that that, that get it done um, in terms of being open source and, and you can use them and they have all the features and functions. Great, and maybe we can plan Caesar and if anyone else has questions, we can follow up and maybe have a list of other services as we come to them. So thanks. Thank you. All right. Okay, so what happened with me? Like, how did I end up here being a CIO of some big weird resort company? So, um, you know, first when I was at UCSB, I got involved, um, they had in Phelps Hall, there used to be what was called a microcomputer lab where we had Macintosh computer labs for students to use because they didn't sometimes have their own word processors, if you can imagine that. And so in, the, in that microcomputer lab, um, we did a whole bunch of stuff. We used to teach how to use Microsoft Excel, night classes. We would help students you know, with using different programs. Printing was always an issue, a whole bunch of, whole bunch of fun stuff too. Um, and, uh, and at the time, this guy, Mark Andreessen, worked, was at University of Illinois. We're trying to figure out multimedia. And this other friend of his, Mark Cool, and this other guy I was working with, Mark, like, oh, yeah, we figured out a way to put images um, on, on computer screens rather than having text-based, you know, editing. Like, what is it? It's called, it's called, it's on the World Wide Web, but it's called HTML. You guys should check it out. So we did, and working with them, we built the first website at UC, the UC system at the computer lab, which was a lot of fun and kind of kept in touch with those guys. Um, but that was just a way of getting involved, just finding a campus job at that time, or you know, looking at other places that uh, you, know, you can do things uh, with. So I, that took me up to um, San Francisco, where I said, I'm gonna build this internet service provider startup. So I went to a company called Pacific Bell, now AT&T, I needed to open an ad, put an ad in the paper for what was called an internet service provider in San Francisco, and they had no listing under internet. So that was kind of funny. So uh, that was that was fun to put the first internet, you know, out there uh, for in San Francisco. Um, then uh, yeah, after time that worked out pretty well, and um, I had some VCs say, you know what, you're smart, you have a you have a, a, a startup mentality, but you should work in a big company and understand big things. So I worked my way into an insurance company, roadside assistance, AAA. Um, they were kind enough to pay for my N MBA at University of San Francisco, which worked out great while I was working. So that was a lot of fun. That's why I bumped into statistics all over again. It's like deja vu, this thing keeps coming up. Um, you know, and then from there, worked there for a while and uh, really got into like, hey, what's gonna happen in the world where 
I think this video stuff's going to get digitized somehow because it's all analog right now. And sure enough, I ended up at University of, um, uh, sorry, I ended up at NBC Universal being in charge of digital media, uh, working in an IT organization, but digitizing content. So, you know, they used to take every day uh, when they film a show, they do it in a studio and they used to do it. They take the film that they do it on, they go to what's called a post house. It's easy, you'll love this. You know, they, they, develop, <laughs> they develop the film, put it on a tape and then send that tape to production so they could see what was filmed every day. I'm like, oh, if we digitize that and then moved it digitally to a computer, you know, they could actually watch it from their computer to their TV screen and they wouldn't be stuck in traffic and they'd know what's going on a lot quicker. And some of you guys might ever wonder what a producer does in TV. They're basically a CFO. So if they see the same scene being filmed over and over and over and over and over again, they're over budget on that show and they pick up the phone and make a call. But usually they knew that the tape was going to get there. Yeah, you know, take them at least a day to get there. But when we digitize the whole process of putting digital dailies onto a desktop computer and playing to a TV, those producers picked up the same day and we had a lot of directors that weren't happy with me. But anyway, it was a fun story. Loved working at NBC Universal and we really started deal dealing with download and digital rights management and a whole bunch of different things. And then I got a call in Vegas from a, from a guy who, um, the president of our studio used to gamble a lot <laughs> in Vegas. So he'd go out there and they were building this new project called City Center. You guys might recognize the name Aria, but it was a little $8.2 billion project. And they're like, yeah, we need technology in it from the ground up. And you gotta understand, I had to fight with the CEO to get Wi-Fi in the room in this property. Cause he's like, John, we don't need Wi-Fi. They have, they have, they can plug their computer into the cable. You know, like they, can, they can do that. I mean, the iPhone was just coming out in 2007. Wi-Fi wasn't there, fought for that, had to put cell phone systems in like everywhere, not just the, not just the ground floor, but all through the resort. It was a lot of fun, um, had a lot of great times, a really fun thing to do, learned a lot during, during that time. And then that's when I made this transition to marketing tech because the company that owned uh, City Center, they, they own a lot of properties. They own Bellagio and they own Mandalay Bay and then Jim Grant and a whole bunch of ones. And they bought all these things at, over time, but they all had different user experiences in terms of their websites and how things happened and what would go on. And so if you went to go book a room at Bellagio and then you wanted to go book a restaurant over at Aria, you couldn't do it. Different websites, it's just a whole horrible user experience. So they asked me to be the chief digital officer but we took all those websites and we took all the offer management, we put everything together. So you can go to one site, book anything in the whole family differently. Um, it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, so I had a great time doing that, did some wireless stuff and then loved, I, I prefer over the wireless stuff. I really preferred, you know, being involved with the customer. So I got a phone call from uh, the Cosmo Cosmopolitan to come back and the CEO of Aria became the CEO of Cosmopolitan which is, I think next slide Alex, where I am now. So if you've ever been to Las Vegas or seen it, um, the Cosmopolitan Las Vegas, it is a um, 3000 room uh, resort. We really love our brand uh, because we're, we're not multi, multi property like the other ones I just mentioned. Uh, you know, we can really do things quickly and innovate and do a lot of fun stuff and get involved with all lines of business. We're working on digital wallets and we're working on cashless systems keyless systems, um, really just how to change the whole organization, you know, really, 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 um, you know, try to revolutionize and do some things that are exciting. They're owned by a bigger company. So a company called Blackstone out of New York, you might hear of them from time to time. They own a lot of stuff. They own us too. Um, but it's fun working with them because you get to, you get to be this uh, independent company uh, in Las Vegas, but you have a really big company behind you that can help you with um, working with some of the larger companies out there. But this is what my organization looks like. You know, so I'm what's called the chief information officer. Um, I have a group of people that um, are called business solutions. And those are all those folks who make sure that everyone in the business is getting what they need from a technology standpoint. We got a big security department where we deal with compliance and threat detection, auditing, provisioning, cybersecurity, a whole bunch of different things. It becomes larger and larger. You know, we have to deal with cyber insurance now, a whole bunch of different things. I have a bunch of engineers who do very technical things. It's got typo in there, which are from anywhere from servers to internet, networking, Wi-Fi, all our cloud technology, our databases. There's a whole bunch of services they provide that make the networks work. 
You got a bunch of data and architecture people. They love writing software. They love collecting data. They just go out there and you know they're right, they're building our websites. They're making these data marks by taking multiple sources of data and putting them in one place for the business. They're working on artificial intelligence, automation. Uh, that, like I mentioned, the software development, getting into the data lakes with companies like Snowflakes, big data warehouses. And the difference is like a data warehouse might be something where you store data, but you don't use it a lot. But when you want to use the data a lot, you need a place where it's really accessible, not your data lake. Um, so those type of things will happen. And they do a lot of product development. So they look at what's our booking engine? What, how does that work? How many steps to log in? And then a whole services group that does everything. So all that technology we have, you know, we have to support it, you know, for our guests and for our, for our internal customers. We have to tag everything to make sure we know where everything we bought is. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, we got to monitor everything to make sure it still works and it goes up. We had a part of our cell phone system, cell phone system go down on Super Bowl Sunday in Las Vegas. That's not fun. Um, and so we do that. And then we track it, how incidences uh, are, are managed. You know, we do it. What, what happens? How do you deal with something when it goes down? You know, what, what do you do? You know, okay, we, we lost part of our cell phone system on Sunday. What do we do? Well, we replace the part that's broken, but we got to get the right people in the right places, send out notifications, make sure people are aware, you know, manage that whole process and make sure that it's done. So that's a, um, pretty much a day in the life for me. And I'm touched all those different things every different day. Um, big concept is you do uh, a lot of things. You got to keep running every day, make sure it works, make sure they don't crash. And then you're always building new things every day. You're working on something new whether it be a network, an upgrade. Um, we're right, right now, if you've ever been to the Cosmopolitan, we have these, this beautiful digital art program um, on these lobby columns that are really fancy. They're 10 years old, got to replace them all. So, you know, there's a new project that we got to get, get going down to put new digital art up. Um, and we got to work with the marketing folks who make this beautiful artwork that will be displayed digitally. But that's all IT, you know, from one side to the other. So that's the way. Um, hey, John. Oh, great. Thank you. Yep. I just wanted to say we have some questions coming in. So I wanted to throw out these two questions before we move over to Alex, because we have some questions about your career journey. The first one is from Ethan, who asks, how did you make that transition from UCSB to the ISP? Uh, that's a great question. It was um, just some people we were talking about uh, because we saw everyone started to need internet access from instead of bulletin board access. And so just a group of you know, my friends started talking. We said, yeah, we should build an internet service provider and we can do it by you know, getting some, we, we, we found some very technical people and then some visionary people and we're like, yeah, let's like have a dial up service provider. So it was actually our idea and we started it. Um, we just found the right, we found the right people in Silicon Valley to kind of believe in us. And that was in Patola Valley area at a bar, but uh, that was, you know, that's how it got started. You know, it was just an idea and then we followed through with it. Great, okay. Um, shows the power of networking, huh? <laughs> yeah, power of networking on the network. Exactly, okay. And um, the next question, then we'll move on to you, Alex. I wanna make sure we have enough time to cover both of you. So um, from Kenneth, he says, since you brought up MBA and it being a crucial to your process, I was wondering if you see many applicants with the UCSB Masters in Technology Management, how much do you weigh your work experience versus your MBA? Um, great question. Uh, I think any, any secondary degree is great. You know, if it's MBA, PhD, you know, MA, MT, MTM, you know, all that type of your master's in technology management, it all makes a difference. It shows you care. It shows you really want to pursue it. it shows you, you know, put in some extra effort. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think people are looking for that secondary degree, you know, it just, it differentiates you. So I, I do think it's important. Um, I do uh, believe in it. And um, I think you know, the MTM program, you know, is, I think is, is a great one also to show that, you know, hey, I really, really took it to another level. Great, thanks. All right, let's move on to Alex. Cool, I've got to unmute myself. So um, actually, let me go back to, to this really quickly. So, um, just to calibrate you all, I'm at a different stage in my career journey than John. Um, obviously, um, you know, there are very, very different paths into um, IT work. And just to show you um, this organization overview again, this is very similar, um, slight, slight differences with um, Procore's IT organization. Um, but I live in this space. 
right now. So as we think about my career journey, I think it's going to make more sense now that you understand the overview, um, knowing there are multiple facets of IT. This is, I live in the, we call it business systems, business solutions, um, very similar, but I'll, I'll kind of describe how we got there um, in my path, but you can see kind of where it all rolls up. Um, we have a CIO who I report to um, and, and all of these different facets exist at Procore as well. So it's a little bit of continuity there. Um, so in terms of my journey, um, I wanted to show you how a linear it was uh, for me. I, uh, I started off um, and, and kind of calling out some of the things that prompted me to be interested in systems, a lot around data, um, a lot around process, right? So a lot of things that John talked about, maybe you don't necessarily uh, associate those with IT off the bat, um, but I'll tell you why. Um, you'll kind of see the thread that goes through um, my career journey. So when I was at UCSB, I was an intern, um, managed um, the summer in for our um, alumni association. And in those roles, I was doing a lot of data entry um, and database management. It can be very dry work. It's not super glamorous. It's all very back end. But the reason that that was important is because I started to understand the structures that go into that information. If I enter this data point here, how does it show up in a report? If I want to pull a report and I'm missing this whole data set, I got to go all the way back to the beginning, clean it up so that I have accurate data to report on and then build my strategy or my program or my visual. Um, so I think um, any sort of um, data entry, getting your, your hands dirty with that can lead either into statistics, as John mentioned, into process development and strategy, can lead into code, right? There's so many um, things that can branch out from, from database management. So don't discount that sort of experience on a resume, especially as an intern or someone that's a little bit um, younger in your career. Um, so I started off with that. I actually left UCSB and went straight to my master's program. So to John's point, you know, my master's has nothing to do with IT. It was in global studies. Um, but any sort of secondary degree gives you a bigger, um, you know, view of, of things. It also affords you other, oper other opportunities in an academic space. So I participated as a member of a logistics team um, for a TEDx event. And I bring up that experience, A, because it was more about more data, more, more tracking applicants, understanding how to report and plan based on a data set. But then it also gave me experience that led to a job with the Aspen Institute. Um, I spent three years there, two and a half, three years at the Aspen Institute as a program associate. Um, the thread here in terms of IT is that I started off doing events and I was doing recruiting for a fellowship program. But I had an opportunity, being a millennial, to build out digital marketing. <laughs> so they had no social media. They had no sort of anything, any sort of digital outreach. They didn't have email campaigns. I mean, we were talking like rudimentary, uh, no data tracking on um, click-through rates, nothing. So I started to just pull together off the cuff, like researching on my own and built out both email campaigns, digital uh, or social media campaigns, things like that, and all of our accounts. But the real interesting piece was there is this uh, migration from an old database to this fancy tool called Salesforce. I didn't know what Salesforce was. I was too young. John's probably laughing at me right now to really understand the magnitude of Salesforce. But the opportunity that I jumped at, didn't know why at the time, was migrating this old database into Salesforce. So again, I understood databases. I understood data entry. So I was able to then apply that to say, great, we're going to go from this old tool to this new one. And here is where it starts to tie in a little bit to the job I have now. I had to think about when we migrate this data, what do we care about? What do we care about tracking and why? Because then you can build out processes around the data that you're tracking. So I learned about Salesforce. I learned to be an analyst in this role, I would say. Um, and, and systems analysis is kind of the space that I work in now. Um, but I learned how to, to ask questions around why do we do something this way? And that is so much of technology and so much of, of IT, especially in the business solutions and data realm. So that um, migration was something I asked to participate in. I said, I want to I want to understand this. I want to be part of it. Um, and I worked with the system administrator at the time to learn Salesforce and learn that application and, you know, learn how to, to migrate data. So that was hugely important. Um, temporary role, just to get myself back to Santa Barbara, I worked as a program associate producing all Gaucho Reunion. This one's not super important in my IT journey, but um, a little bit of a milestone there. I was only there for three months, got me reconnected uh, with the council and UCSB, so I'm highlighting it because it's important to me personally. Um, and it got me back to CARP, or Santa Barbara area. 
Um, and that's when I start getting, started getting connected with Procore. So my foot in the door at Procore was as a project manager, which played off of experience in all of these other areas. Um, but it was a project manager and a systems manager. And at the time I was like, I don't know what the heck this means. Uh, I like project managing, great. I can do events, I can do logistics. And I kind of have some experience with data migration and with, with the Salesforce system, right? So great. So I jumped in there and I started managing our um, uh, recruiting projects as well as our applicant tracking system. So applicant tracking system or ATS for short is what all recruiting teams are powered by um, in the business solution space, um, along with many other pieces of technology. And that's my first entry point to true application management and understanding the power of a system to, as John mentioned many times, automate process. So now my brain is thinking constantly about how do I take a manual process and stick it into a system? And that is a job in itself. Just even thinking through um, how do you take a process that's manual and convert it into something that can be automated, that's where a business analyst lives or a business systems analyst, um, many titles for it. But that's the layer between the stakeholder, your partner, and the entry point to IT. So think about it as like, uh, John, you know, feel free to weigh in here as well, but think about that sort of space as a translator. And this is where I think IT is most relevant to most, most digestible to a comm student is like, okay, you could serve as a translator, right? You're a communicator. That's all that role is. Okay, this person wants to do this. I need to take that and I need to make it into a, a process that I can then send over to my engineer or send over to my configurator, right? Someone that's maybe a little bit more technical and being that bridge. So I really found a lot of joy in that space. Um, and it led to my job now, which is managing an entire function around talent technology. So our applicant tracking system, our human capital management tool, um, basically every integration in and out of that space. I don't code at all. I don't understand code, but I know how to put together a team um, and get the right resources in place and ask the right questions to build those functions. So that's where I am. I manage process systems and data across all of our talent technology for Procore. Um, I manage a team of three, soon to be four people. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, how you get to, um, how you can get to a, a career in IT with, with minimal IT background. I don't have a, you know, an engineering or a systems degree. Um, and it's still possible to move into this space. And it also, I think my career journey has shown me that um, being interested in process and data is just as much an entry point as being interested in engineering or product management. Um, so that is, that's my journey. Um, and again, just to go back here, so when, um, just to relate this back to, to, uh, to John's org again, I live in here, we manage, you know, my team probably manages between 15 and 20 applications in some space, but we have counterparts in financial systems, we have counterparts in uh, revenue systems, uh, we have counterparts in enterprise systems, think the Slacks or the Google um, tools that you have, those are managed by our enterprise IT function. Um, and we're partnering super closely with all other areas of IT to make sure that they're successful. So it's also my job as a business relationship manager to understand, okay, I live in this space, but I need to get resourcing from IT. Or if I launch this business solution, our service desk better understand how to own and operate that tool or support our end users when they have questions. Um, or I'm launching this um, new tool and I need it to go behind um, a single sign-on provider, okay, is this what we want to use, and, and kind of doing the outreach and connecting the dots between the pieces of IT. So that's where I, I live um, my day-to-day, -day, and it's a really fun, you know, communication role, connector role, um, things like that. So that's just to tie it back, and before we go on to um, some resources and any other questions, um, I'll just pause there for a second, make sure no one has questions or Don doesn't want to weigh in. I did a great job. Cool. Thank you for that deep dive. I'll well, just remind folks again, you can put a question in the chat. Um, you can also just come off mute. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and maybe I'll throw it out there, John. At the end of Ken's question earlier, he asked more about master's programs. Let me read the second part of his question. I'm the director of operations uh, for a local Santa Barbara company now, about 150 employees, not in the tech industry. And I'm curious about master's programs that your industries look for most. Um, <clears throat> great question. Uh, 
Yeah, it, to me, as we look at the masters, it's it's not even so much the technology management, but it's more getting into you know, what Alex talks about. It's it's funny enough. It's 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 about our major. It's about getting people to communicate with one another. I mean, just today, I can't tell you how many times in working at home and having people working remotely, you lose that interpersonal communication, that casual communication. I can't tell you how many times I have to tell people to pick up the phone and call one another and communicate because the engineering group is so determined that they're going to go engineer something they're not bothering to tell the security group what they're engineering and they're getting upset with one another um but in, in you know in your mba you know some of those some of those things across the whole organization are so important again i talked about administration and you get up there you're starting to you know you're, you're having multi-million dollar projects multi-million dollar budgets and, and understanding kind of the finance and the accounting, you know, how, how are you differentiating between a capital project, which does certain things to your stock price versus an operational project, which do bad things to your stock price, because you want, you want to minimize your operational spend versus your capital spend that you can depreciate over time. I won't get into the details of that, but it's a very important concept to understand what's in my OPEX budget, like my labor and my employees and my maintenance contracts and my supplies versus what's in my capital project, I'm building something new, like the digital signs I just mentioned and, and how those you know, interplay with each other. So that, that's a great thing to have you know, in your master's and your MBA from the business side of it. Um, then again, you get more you know, statistic classes. You know, I think as, as Alex was talking about that, just you know, the database entry and using data the right way to understand it. That's really great. Um, and then some of just the you know understanding at the end of the day, you know, technology, it, it can be an interesting thing. And some technology companies, it's all about the product. So when you look at what Alex does in Procore, they're building a technology product and that's their product, that's what they sell. Well, I'm not a technology product. I just, if without me, the product doesn't work. You can't check in, you can't get on the internet, your door lock doesn't work, you can't make a bet, you can't buy food, can't order room service. Yeah, it kind of sucks if things in my world don't work for the guest experience, but I'm not the one making the money. You know, I'm not, yes, I, yes, I build the website where people could book a room. But understanding that from a master's perspective or understanding like, wow, I understand how I can relate what my job does for the business, whether your job in the business is building the actual product that's, or service that's sold online, you know, whatever that is, versus I'm really in a support role, making sure that every, all the dots are connected and things are working and whoever's using the product or service can actually do that and we can collect revenue for doing that that all helps in the master's program. So, you know, I think having that, you know, breadth of understanding, you know, from a master's program um, about business, you know, accounting, statistics, you know, those type of things is just a nice thing to have in terms of giving a different appreciation for where, where do you fit in your company and how are you adding value? Great. Yeah, and I think that the other thing to keep in mind, and, and this may not be something that um, everyone on this call knows yet, but there are definitely, um, because I think the picture John and I wanted to paint when we talked about this session is how broad IT is. It's not just engineering, right? And I think that, that it's very easy to conflate. And when you remember that and you see this type of work structure, which is why I brought it back up, you realize how many different types of skill sets are needed to power modern IT organizations. Um, that means that there are a lot of different sorts of degrees that are valuable. So you're not just trying to, you know, okay, I want to get into IT, like I need to have a master's in information management. That's great. But in my, you know, arena, if you're doing business systems or solutions, um, I could be very interested in you having a communication master's. I could be very interested in you having you know, some sort of a, a certificate around process design or design thinking, right? It's very um, diverse. And so just remembering that and understanding where your skill sets are um, and where you would plug in, I think is really, really crucial. So we have two questions that have come in around certifications. So either of you could address that. The first is, could you possibly elaborate on what certifications we could work on getting that would benefit us most, especially if we are communication students looking to get internships to work with data. That was from Jasmine and Haley says, has anyone tried the Google certification for data analytics or know more about the certificates in general? 
I was going to mention, I haven't tried them myself, but I do have people on my staff who work for me today who are getting them. And why I bring that up is that it opens up the door. I think Alex's story just about doing the data entry is so interesting and so fascinating. And my, my experience of working in a microcomputer lab, you know, with the internet, you know, hair had the internet, wow, who had the internet back then? You know, I had the internet and email and those were special things back in my day that not, not everybody got. Uh, but just, I got my hands on it. So I could easily talk about building a website, you know, early on in 1995 or 93 and that no one was doing that. So, it, it, but so getting those, getting those certificates or exploring those programs, getting that hands-on component, no matter how you do it, whether it be with Google, or again, you take, take an internship or a job where you're just willing to put in the work to get your hands on is important. And I do believe like both on the Google certificates, the free code camps, just having that under your belt. So you have a little more confidence that, yep, I can take on that work. Um, Cause even, even with some of my, you know, with my staff, uh, the fact that they're doing something different. So they might be working on one thing, but they want to get into security and they did the security cert uh, certification or certificate. They took a, they took a test. I'm, I happen to be a Microsoft certified um, professional. I uh, went through a whole class and took six tests to do that. It was grounding because I understand some of the technical things, but again, I'm not doing the code, but I understand what's happening when, you know, the basics, the basic levels of networking are going wrong. But again, those were, those are me just taking the exams to get that certification that just kind of got me in the door to do different things. And so, you know, was, you know Cisco has a certain, you can take it one test to get a Cisco certification. Uh, Microsoft has one, Google's doing the certificates out there. Um, and that just helps you get your foot in the door. And I think it's important if you, you know, whatever works for you, um, you know, in, in however it works. I mentioned the free code, camp, code camp, camps because they're free and people like Apple and people like um, Google and people are hiring people from those organizations because they're just looking for coders. Uh, so it, it, there's, in my, the point of this is there's a lot of resources out there to get your hands dirty. And, and I think I think that's a, a big part of it is just trying to get your hands on a keyboard or or in, into an environment where you're actually trying it yourself. And that that really is what starts giving you ideas. Awesome. Thanks, John and Alex. That's fantastic information. And we will share these slides just so everyone doesn't have to write all this down. We'll share the slides on the communication resources website that we use for this event. So we'll be putting that on on Facebook and Instagram as well, but uh, we'll put these slides up there. Um, I know we're um, over 6.45 and 6.50. If anyone has to drop off, we'll take another question. If anyone has um, any other questions before we close, any brave folks wanna ask a question live or just shoot something in chat while we have John and Alex? No, I think we're set. All right. Um, then why don't we close with the schedule of the next sessions? If you could just put that up there. Uh, oh, I guess that's okay. The next session is March 10th. So we don't need to, we'll share it on, on um, Instagram and Facebook, but just so you guys know, thank you very much. Thank you, John and Alex. And please join us next month for discussion with Alexei about careers in advertising. Thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.